So if there's a horse walking around the desert, what is that horse looking for? Now, if you thought that that horse was looking for uh, a person to ride it, you're mistaken. If you thought that that horse was thinking, oh, if I can only find a cowboy, maybe he'll have spurs and a whip, and he'll put a bit in my mouth, and he'll tell me what to do, and it'll be great. It's not happening. Uh, a horse has primarily one main concern, and it's answering this question, which is, will the herd that I belong to keep me safe today? And everything that a horse does depends on how they answer that question. And you see, teenage boys are the same way because there's not a teenage boy on this planet that wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I hope I can find someone to boss me around today. <laughs> That'd be great. And then if I didn't go along with it, they could take away privileges and criticize me and, and uh, make me feel really crummy about myself. That would just be great. Now, what do they want? They want to find and belong to a group that keeps them safe. So wild horses and teenage boys have a lot in common. Um, it's in their nature to resist being told what to do, and yet their very survival depends on belonging to a group. So what happens when you introduce um, a teacher, a police officer, a parent, a horse trainer, a cowboy, a coach into this equation? Well, typically the introduction goes something like this. If I'm the, the uh, parent, I say, hi, my name's Matt, and I'm the person that's taking it upon myself to make you do things that you don't want to do. So when can we begin? And the horse or the boy says, well, never. So how do you train a wild horse? Well, there's one way we talked about earlier, the cowboy with me, the cowboy method, the spurs, the bits. Um, you buck the horse out and you make the horse do what you want. And it's effective, you get the horse to do things. But at the end of the day, that wild horse doesn't want anything to do with that trainer. There's another method called natural horsemanship, and it operates under this understanding that the horse did not choose to be trained. That was my decision as a trainer. And so I have the obligation to ask the horse's permission to train him. So how am I gonna do that? Well, I'm gonna understand where the horse is coming from, understand what's important to that horse. And what's important to the horse is belonging to a herd that keeps him safe. So in natural horsemanship, I'm going to attempt to learn how to communicate with the horse in a way that they'll understand that I'm that safety. <clears throat> and this is the philosophy behind the boys ranch that's out in Aravaca right now. They have about 30 students. And what they do is they take all these wild horses and they take all these wild boys, we put them together, and we teach the boys natural horsemanship. And then we give each boy a wild horse that's never been ridden by any belts. It's just as honoring, just as mean-spirited and independent as the boy is. And we say, train them. And then we step back and watch as the horse teaches the boy things about themselves, things about their family, things about God, that no parent, teacher, police officer could ever teach them. <clears throat> And that's where I come in. So I worked down there for about three years. And on the ranch, they do this natural horsemanship, the training, but then they also do school, they have therapy, they have recreational activities and uh, work projects. And I would schedule and coordinate all of that. And I lived on the ranch with my family. And just to kind of give you an idea of what we might expect in a typical day at the ranch, I'd be doing any number of things. The, the best is when we're at an intake and a new student. Um, and it goes something like this, their parents drop them off or a uh, transport service drops them off and I introduce myself, hi, I'm Matt, this is the place you're gonna be living for the next 10 months. And typically that's when I hear the F word <clears throat> and I'm really good at hearing that word, you hear it an awful lot. Um, or they, uh, there's always the never ending attempts to get high um, with whatever available materials they have. So for example, do you know if you take uh, cow manure and wait till it's growing mushrooms, you combine that with a bunch of orange peels and goat urine, Put it in a plastic bag, let it sit for three months in the sun, squeeze the water out of it, or juice or whatever it is, and then drink it, but you can waste it on that stuff. Well, actually, you can't, but that doesn't stop the boys from trying. They'll try anything, anything to get high. Um, and they, all, they do all sorts of fun stuff. They'll catch animals, they'll catch uh, 
little ground chucks and snakes, and they'll make them fight each other and things like that. It's, it's kind of great, because most of these kids are all suburb kids who've never stepped foot on anything that wasn't totally flat concrete or carpet, and now they're in the middle of nowhere in Arawaka, and it can be really neat. <clears throat> um, so basically what you've got out here at the ranch is you've got about 30 boys, and they're running around trying to find and belong to a group where they fit in and where they are safe. And those two things are often not the same. So it can be very confusing for a teenage boy. And on a good day, the staff down there <clears throat> are living their lives in a way where they can provide that safe place for these teenage boys who, you know, for whatever reasons, aren't able to live with their families at the time because of crazy stuff that's going on at home. And um, some days we do really good, and some days um, not so good. Uh, one day in particular I remember is a really, you know, it's a long, it's a lot of work. You get up really early in the morning, at like five o'clock in the morning, plan the whole day, and it's it's late. It's a uh, at, well after lights out, I walk over to my house that's right there on the ranch, and I am excited to relax. I take off my boots, and no sooner do I have my boots off that I hear on the radio, I hear the boys, they're on the roof. They're not going to get down. It's supposed to be a radio. <laughs> anyway, you know. And I'm just like frustrated. I'm like, man, why can't my staff solve these problems? Why do I have to resolve everything? Put my boots on, so I'm gonna go fix this, put my boots back on, grab my big flashlight, and I walk out of my house, I walk around the corner to the bunkhouse, and I see there's this shape up on the roof, and I shine my light, it's right there really close, I shine my light, and those of you that have been in schools before know that every grade level or every classroom has that one kid, that one kid that's the bad influence and everyone else, just get him out of there and then things will be fine, right? Well, that's what the ranch does. We take that one kid from schools all over the country. <laughs> and it's a, it shouldn't be any surprise, but among all those one kids, there's always one kid. <laughs> and that's the kid that's on the roof. And I'm thinking, I got it. Like, I got it. He's right here. You know, he can't escape me now. And he looks at me, and he jumps off the roof. And he lands right on top of the large air conditioning unit that goes into the boys' bunkhouse. And as he lands on it, of course, the grate buckles underneath his weight, and the fan that's inside immediately starts smashing against the side, and the whole thing's shaking like it's gonna come apart, just making all sorts of noise. So I'm standing right there, I flip off the breaker, and I look at him, he looks at me, he looks at the air conditioner, he looks back at me and he says, I didn't do that. <laughs> And now it's personal, right? Because, you know, climbing on the roof, I get that. That's fun, I understand why they're doing it, not a problem there, but lying to my face? You know, he needs to learn. And he's not gonna learn it from me, so I know something. I know that inside of that bunkhouse are 10 teenage boys. And by the very nature of the fact that they're teenage boys, that place smells really bad. <laughs> Compound that the fact that they are working with horses all day long and shoveling the manure, even on the day when that air conditioning unit is working great, the place stinks. So I walk in, I walk around, walk into the bunk, and I just kind of casually, hey guys, I uh, just want to let you know it's probably going to get really hot in here tonight. Um, your bunkmate over there, when he jumped off the roof, he broke the air conditioner. And it's probably going to be a week or so before we get something out to fix it. Just wanted to let you know. And I step back, and I wait. And these boys, I mean, they're good. They pick up on my cue like that. They know what to do. And they start, you know, oh man, what's your problem, dude? What? You jumped off the roof and broke the air conditioner. Are you dumb? And, and they just go in on it. It's going to get so hot in here. And um, I'm thinking, this is good. He's learning, right? He was learning from me, but now he'll learn from his peers. And um, it keeps going, and as it tends to happen, it kind of escalates, and it's getting, you know, kind of little. The insults are a little heavy, so I think, okay, now it's time for me to step in. Now it's time for me to intervene and rescue. I'm about to do that when I notice that the oldest boy in the bunk, the boy, he's the oldest, he's been at the program the longest, he's doing really well, he's leadered all the other boys, about ready to go home. He walks over to this boy. And he says to him, he looks him right in the eye, and he says, 
you are worthless, man. And you're always going to be worthless. And when that older boy said that to that kid, I realized what I had been doing. And I, I knew that I could not undo the damage that I'd done. But there was one thing that I could do. And I went over to my shop, picked up some tools, fixed the air conditioner, and I turned it back on. 